26 in service, starting mileage 2937, 2937. Officers Perkins and Barner on station call Jefferson and Stanley. Check 56, 621 p.m., starting night watch. This is Don Reed, and I'm the police recorder riding with this detective unit on the call. The sounds you are listening to are authentic. Now, uh, where are we going? What are we going to do? Well, I can't answer that question because it hasn't happened. But you're going to ride with us tonight and just listen while the cases unfold. Now, remember one thing. The people you hear are not actors. This is it. This is real. This is what happens on the Night Watch. Night Watch. The actual on-the-scene report of your police force in action. There are no actors. There is no script. Every voice, every sound is authentic. The investigations are recorded as they actually occur. Night Watch, presented with the cooperation of the Police Department of Culver City, California, W.N. Hildebrand, Chief. We switch you now to car 5-6 on patrol and your police recorder, Don Reed. It's uh, 6.23 p.m., and we're already on a call here on the night watch. And just as we were leaving the station, the watch commander ordered this unit to uh, Jefferson and Stanley at the gas station to investigate a possible suspect passing bad checks. Well, as I uh, understand the situation, one of our uniform cars has the suspect in custody at the scene. So in uh, just a matter of seconds, we'll be there. Sort of a sidelight to this deal, in the uh, terminology of the police department, they refer to a person passing bad checks as uh, a paper hanger. <laughs> Somehow I always get amused at that expression. Well, uh, speaking of the gas station, here we are. A gentleman dressed in a blue outfit is waiting for us off on the left. One of our cars has the possible suspect detained. So uh, let's get out with the sergeant and see what this is all about. Are you the uh, manager? Yes, sir. Can we uh, step in the station and talk to you a second? I understand you had uh, some bum checks passed here. Can you tell us a little something about it? Yes, I can. Uh, chap drove in and uh, he said, would I take a personal check? And I said, for the amount of the purchase only, I figured that if it was a phony or something, he wouldn't. He wouldn't want to put him on the purchase, but he said, okay. Did you ever see the call before? No, I hadn't. said to uh, that, uh, go ahead, fill the tank up. And so I uh, was filling it up, and he mentioned that he had been in here a year ago, and I cashed a check for him then, and also he'd been in three months ago in a different car, and I cashed a check then. So I did at that time begin to get a little suspicious of him. But I couldn't figure his ways of getting the extra money. Mm -hmm. He said, well, while you got it here, go ahead and lube and drain it. So I said, okay. So we pulled it around, put it on the rack, and drained the oil. And when, while I was lubing it, he said, asked me if I had a, uh, any white sidewall tires in stock. And I thought then that that was what his angle was, to have me throw them in the back of the car and, and go out. So I told him, no, I didn't have them. I'd have to order them. So he said, well, do you run the wash rack? I said, no. That belongs to another party that you'll have to take back, it back and have it washed. So when we dropped it down, he wrote out the check for me and then turned around, took it back to the wash rack. And while it was in the uh, tunnel or through the process of being washed, I called the Pasadena branch of this bank that he gave me the check on. And they took several minutes. And then they finally come back and told me it wasn't any good. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, he came up here and I told him his check wasn't any good. I asked him what he was going to do about it. And he said, uh, well, uh, okay, something's gone wrong. He said, I'll pay you for it. So he took out his pocketbook and he had uh, around $3 in it. And he said, well, you take this and take my spare tire and I'll be back in a little while. And I said, no, you leave the car and then come back, bring me back the money. He said, well, okay, I'll be back here in an hour and give you the money. And he said, so keep the car here. I forgot to tell you that during the time that they had to call the Culver City Police and they were going to, they had a patrol car in the way and the patrol car arrived at the time that uh, he was started in that store. I see. And then they immediately went over and picked him up. They, they picked him up over there at yes, the uh, store right. across the street. Over yes, that was just... Okay, fine. Thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome. 
out here on the street again, and uh, sitting across in one of our cars, I see the suspect in the back, with uh, guarded by an officer. Apparently, he's handcuffed. I can see his hands twisted in behind his back. So, uh, from here, now let's go on down to police headquarters and follow through with this investigation. I'm speaking now from the detective bureau from police headquarters. Sergeant Perkins has been assigned another investigation for the moment, so we are following this case through. The suspect, arrested a few moments ago on suspicion of attempting to pass a bad check, is seated at the desk. Questioning him, uh, Lieutenant Connor uh, and Detective Henson of the forgery detail. Uh, in this area before? Uh, I've passed some around, yes, a few of them. How many places did you visit in Culver City while you were here? Just one. And how many checks altogether do you say, would you say you have out? I don't know. Where are these checks? Uh, around in the area. I mean, uh, I mean around the Los Angeles area. We put out an all-points bulletin. What kind of reports are we going to get back from these other towns? San Diego. <laughs> no, I don't know. Well, we want to know in the L.A. area approximately how many checks have you put out here? Approximately. Uh, half a dozen, maybe, a little more. Uh, how much... Uh, where you, would you generally make these checks for? Approximately about ten dollars. About ten dollars, and you would go in and buy something, yeah, and then you'd get uh, back some money in return, yeah, uh, and you'd always use your name, but you uh, you never forged any checks. It was always yeah, NSF. Use my name. Use yeah. your name, and you would. Uh, it was just uh, insufficient funds in, in the bank. Mm. Uh, no account. No yeah. account yeah. checks. Well, I tell you what. You know that you uh, have committed a crime. You know that you yeah, have. Uh, Passed a lot of bad checks, so you know that you're going to be booked. I tried twice to to uh, give myself up. Get cold feet that. and turn around with back. Well, okay, take, yes. him, take him out and book him in on 476A. It's uh, 8.42 p.m., and we're here in the cell block of the police station. Well, since we're not quite ready to go back on patrol at the moment, there's a couple of questions that I'd like to ask this suspect, sort of uh, off the record. So, uh, let's go over and have a talk with him. Uh, tell me, um, how did you get started writing bad checks? Well, it was just the handiest way to keep going after I ran out of the last job. Would seem to be the the best and and safest way. The safest way. It seems to be the safest way to me. I couldn't see running up, running in, and sticking up somebody. I mean, it's just I figured I could come out better by writing a few bad checks and and getting through what I had to have than mm. than I could by sticking up somebody. Did you ever get? Uh, well, we won't say did you ever get caught because uh, looking through these bars, I think we got the answer for that. <laughs> you know, if you could uh, talk to several million young folks. Uh, you know, there might be a few of them that might be getting the idea that they, too, could get some easy money. If you had that chance, uh, what would you tell them? Well, in the first place, it's not easy money. It's hard money because, in the first place, it doesn't belong to you, and your conscience will never let you live it down. And although you can get 15 or $20 maybe by just signing, signing your name on something, it, it's awful hard to live with it. I'm a living example that it doesn't work. Okay. I'll try and pass your message along. Good night. Good night. We've uh, just received a call of a possible attempt suicide in a car. So we're rolling right now. Uh, this call sort of caught us off guard. Well, we were just pulling into a drive-in to have dinner. The sergeant picked up the phone to request code 7 and bang, here we go. Looks like uh, they don't have to wait a while. We've uh, had in our siren, rolling code three. Five two, come in. Here comes a call on our speaker. Five two, go ahead. Five two, at Culver and Globe, attempt suicide. Uh, I'm like the fire department now. You heard control wanted by fire department notified. Means sending inhalator. 
Also, uh, Unit 52, one of our uniformed cars, is running with us. We'll be there in just a matter of seconds now. As we approach each intersection, that siren hits such a high peak, it's almost impossible to talk. Should be in the next block. The street's empty, except for one car parked against the curb on the right-hand side. That must be it. Slowing down. Someone over there pointing, Sergeant. That's the car there? Okay. Thank you. Witness, too frightened to talk. Pointing. Car closed up. One occupant. Here's unconscious. Motor running. Strong possibility carbon monoxide. <clears throat> Comes another one of our units rolling in. In behind us. Yeah, here's one right here, Sergeant. Up to the car. And slumped over the wheel. How's going, Don? You okay? He's short, fat. You okay, huh? Blood drained from his face. <clears throat> been drinking tonight or what? Yeah, it's all right. You're all right, huh? You know, you've been parked here with the motor running, all the windows rolled up. You might have died this way, you know. Yeah. You trying to commit suicide? No. You're not, huh? Get it. It's just a 447 and left his car parked with motor running. You can cancel the inlayer. No, you don't drive the car. Just leave the car alone. <clears throat> He's out of the car. We'll take the keys. Uh, what the uh, key? Keys? We'll, we've got the keys right here. No, I mean, uh... What? Tell the deal. I'll put the keys in there where, uh, put the other speaker. You do what? I mean, uh, put the uh, keys in there where I'll put the other speaker. What speaker? Do you want three of them? What, uh... What, are you selling them? No, no. No, it's blood. You don't know Yeah. No, I was supposed to put in another speaker. You're supposed to put another speaker where? In the office. No, no not the office, <laughs> but over in, the, in, uh, in this room. You know what time it is? Too late. You know where you are? Mm-hmm. Where? Biggest field right now. Or where? No, not that biggest field, but... Uh, out of Fresno. Fresno? Uh, uh, just for the records, Fresno's about 275 miles north of here. Have you ever heard of Culver City? Yes, Culver City. That's where you are now. We're close to home. Okay, Ellis, uh, here's his keys. You better take him in and book him on Drunk Auto. Well, nice little place Let's to sleep Let's get back tonight, to our huh? car. Come on, we'll put you in the bed. Come on, we'll put you in the bed. Come on, we'll put you in the station tonight. 560 Control 1, clear on the attempt suicide, 447A. 52 has subject in custody. Jump 56, 10.15 p.m. What you so quiet about? Mm-hmm. Just thinking. What about him? That guy. What about him? Oh, I don't know. I was just uh, thinking we had to roll code three through all that traffic just for a guy asleep in a car. What's the matter? You want to go back being a radio announcer? No. I think I'll look good with gray hair. (laughs) (laughs) You are listening to Night Watch and following the activities of a detective unit on their tour of duty. The people you hear are not actors. Every voice, every sound is real. Investigations are recorded as they actually occur. We'll give you the final results of tonight's cases at the conclusion of The Night Watch. We all know that insurance is a pretty important thing to have. We insure our homes, our cars, even our lives. Today, more than any other time in our history, we need country insurance. That's right, we need an insurance policy that will cover everything we own, including our lives, from the total destruction of an atomic war. That insurance is the Ground Observer Corps. Find out how you can become a member of the Ground Observer Corps by calling your information operator today. And now we switch you back to Detective Unit 5-6, now on patrol in the field, and to police recorder Don Reed. Okay, 
time you got done. Oh, no, let me check. It's uh, 10.30. I'm hungry, to be honest with you. Me too. Let's eat. <laughs> five, six to one, requesting seven at the hilltop. Control one to five, six. Continue patrol. Stand by for call. Five, six, roger. Well, that takes care of that. Must have something hot. Yeah, control, control one to all units. At one, two, one, six, jewel drive. Ambulance cutting. Five, six, handle the call. Code three. Five, six, ten, four. There goes our dinner. Heard that call. Ambulance cutting. That's the only information we have. There's been a knifing of some sort. Apparently, someone has been injured. There goes our siren now. Sergeant's cutting it in. A knifing. Let's see what does it mean. Is it over with? Is it still going on? What do we look out for when we get there? Well, we're all sort of thinking along those lines right now. Now we have to drop our speed considerably as we approach each intersection so as not to outrun the sound of our siren. If you see any motors coming in from the side street, you can only hear our approach from a short distance, especially if they happen to have the radio going in the car. And now the star is really blasting that siren coming into that intersection. Getting closer. And it's an even number. Should be on the left-hand side of the street. Here it is. Here it is. Small hotel. We're sliding into a stop. There's a group of people scattering for cover. They're waving us into the building. The sergeant is out of the car. Let's get going. On the street. Into the building. Man standing halfway up the stairs. There's blood flowing from his arm or chest. I can't be sure. Now, now he's starting to run, and the sergeant is chasing him. He's turning into a room. Sergeant has him trapped in the corner. I don't want to go. You don't want to go where? I don't want to go. Take a look at this arm, Lennon. I don't want to go. What happened, Tom? I don't want to go. Don't want to go where? I don't want to go. I don't. Do something like a tourniquet out of this. The sergeant is grabbing a tie. Call me off the dresser to make a tourniquet. Okay, just relax a minute. Hey, I don't want to go. All right, let me get this tourniquet on. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. Hold it, little fellow, will you? Hey, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. Let's get this tourniquet on. Hey, you understand it, don't you? Huh? Yeah, we understand it. Hey. You want to call an ambulance, Bill? I don't, I don't want, want to go. Okay. I don't want to go. Okay, now let's just hold it here a minute. Do you know what happened? Look, sit down a minute. Sit down a minute. You, you want to tell me this is what happened? Yeah, what happened? Do you really want to know? Yes, sir. Get your arm, keep your arm up a little bit, will you? So the blood doesn't drip all over. Keep it up here like that. Tell us what happened. What happened, Paul? I have seen so much. It's pitiful. Well, what happened tonight on this deal? What'd you do? Did you try to slash your wrist or something? Huh? I, I just can't see no more. I just... I just, well, just relax. Take it easy, boy. Relax no a minute, will you? We're trying to help you here. Well, just relax. You want to tell us what happened? Hey, uh... My arm's starting to hurt. I know it's going to hurt, but we can keep this closed for about 20 minutes before we have to release it. All right, so I done wrong. I saw I done wrong. What did you do? I was going down there. You got the bleeding stop, Sergeant? Much as possible, Don. You want to tell us what happened? I just took a razor. I don't know. I don't know myself. Do you know that? Where's the razor? Hmm? Is it in the room here? Is it up in the shower room or where? I don't know. Don't let that... Just sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down, relax. Okay. Hold it right there. Boy, I'd like to get that... Come on, come on, come on. Just relax now. Look. You're just aggravating the situation now. Yeah, I'm aggravating it. Why don't you listen to me? We are. We're trying to. Why don't you listen to me? Tell us what you know about it. There he is, boy. Come on. Shake it. As far as I can see, no one came into the room. Yeah, just yeah, glancing I'll out the window, there's an ambulance pulling up to the curb out there. Right there. Don't you see him? No, I don't. Eh? Okay. I don't want nothing. Nothing to do with you. <laughs> a couple of the officers are up here now, 
and are assisting the victim downstairs to the ambulance. Sergeant, can you make anything out of this? I've got some ideas, Don. One thing we know for sure, those wounds weren't self-inflicted. Somebody's been working that fellow over with a razor blade. You can say that again. Let's get over at the am and see if he gets in there okay. Roger. Down on the street. The officers are having a difficult time getting the All victim right. on a stretcher. Fine. All laid down. Fine, fine. Now, well, that's good enough, ain't it? I mean, now, what more to expect? Ain't there a... Slide right down there. Can you take him up a little bit further? Yeah, slide up. Slide up. Slide up. I can slide up more than you ever saw. All right, put your foot down there, fellow. Let me out of here. It's apparent the victim is entering shock, whether he realizes it or not. He's lost a lot of blood. His face is very, very pale. I wonder if you'll ever know how lucky he is we arrived in time. Hey, that's fine. Well, that gets him on the way to the hospital. Officer Ross is riding with him to keep him under control. That takes care of that. Where do we go from here, Sergeant? Let's get back inside, Don, find out what really happened. Roger. Well, we have a possible witness here, so let's uh, follow along and see if we can pick up any information. Uh -huh. He came and knocked on my door. This your door here? Yes, uh-huh. And he says, I want... I want somebody. And I looked at him, and I saw his arms bleeding quite badly. And I said to my husband, I said, honey, I said, this man is bleeding terrible. And so he tried to put a tourniquet on it, and he couldn't do it. So he goes back up there, and he says, I want help. He's here where he threw blood on me, clear from upstairs, downstairs. Do you know who he is or how long he's lived here? No, I don't. But I do know this much. Look down here for this rat pack. You're going to find a bunch of them down here. What rat pack? Where? Don't say anything. Where? Right here. He didn't cut himself with a razor. He was cut with a knife. Now, who cut him? He was cut out front. Did you see it? No, I didn't I see didn't it. I know he was cut. He told me when he came he down He told me. us that he slashed his own wrist. Oh, he didn't. Uh-uh. Well, that bit of information probably won't help much because it doesn't match the physical evidence. Uh, where to, Sergeant? I've got a hunch. It's going back upstairs. Okay. See this blood along here, Don? Yeah. This is where he must have come up and down the hallway several times. Yeah. Check this room here. There's a pool of blood in front of it right here. There's a lot more here than there was down farther. I can say that again. This isn't his room either. Wait a minute. Let me check the door. It's open. Is it? Yeah. Let's go in. Right. Entering the room. Man, slumped over on the bed. Everything is just covered with blood. Now, there's a... Razor blade on the nightstand next to him. Is he... Is he alive, Sergeant? Yeah, he's alive. This is apparently where the fight started. I'll wake him up in a minute. Let's look around a minute first. We had a pretty good fight. It was over the wall, splattered on the wall, and the windows. A we'll pool of blood down here. Yeah. Hey, uh, right here, I got the same information. This is the guy. Yeah, I know. 37, this is the room? Oh. There's a razor in the glass here. Get up and this before police officers. Get up, we want to talk to you. What was the fight all about? I don't have any. You don't have any what? Fight. What's the blood on the floor? What's the razor doing in the glass over here with blood on it? There's the blood on the walls over here and on the sheet there. It's the blood on your arms. You want to tell us about it? Oh, yeah, sure. I'm a police officer, yes. Uh, That's a police officer there with a uniform on, too. What was the fight all about? Uh, you don't know. Huh? Come on, let's go. Uh, let's go. Well, I haven't done nothing. Ooh. Officer Bernard and uh, Sergeant Perkins are now putting these handcuffs on the suspect. Go on, quietly. If you're under arrest, take him in the station, will you? And book him. I don't get it. What could be the motive for a deal like that, Sergeant? I don't know, Don. I think when those fellows sober up tomorrow morning, they won't know either.
You have been listening to an actual case of your police force in action on The Night Watch. This investigation was recorded as it happened. And now, back to police headquarters and Chief W.N. Hildebrand. In the case tonight of the suspect attempting to pass bad checks, he was subsequently booked for violation of 476A Penal Code, the maximum penalty of which is not more than 14 years in the state's prison. Once again, we have the case of an alert citizen following through with his suspicions and passing this information on to the police department. Without this cooperation, the suspect might still be at large and defrauding innocent people such as yourself. The final case tonight involving a man who was cut with a razor blade, both he and his assailant were booked for disturbing the peace. No assault complaint was filed because both men had been drinking and the victim refused to press charges. However, both he and his assailant were booked for disturbing the peace. The maximum penalty for this is $100 fine and 90 days in the city jail. Tonight's quick action on the part of our officers prevented further injury and also possibly saved the victim's life when a tourniquet was applied to stop the flow of blood from the wounds. My department is cooperating to bring you the facts as they actually happen on the night watch so that you may hear for yourself the part you can play in making your police department an effective law enforcement office. If we accomplish only a portion of this, then our efforts shall be well rewarded in bringing you the night watch. Thank you, Chief Hildebrand. You have just heard on-the-scene reports of your police force in action. Every voice, every sound has been real. Night Watch, brought to you through the cooperation of your police department of Culver City, California, is produced by Sterling Tracy and Jim Hedlock, with technical advice by Sergeant Ron Perkins, and is described in the field by police recorder Don Reed.